So I'd like to welcome you to our second in a series of webinars looking at the impact of CRY's research program. From the moment Alison founded CRY 25 years ago, she was dedicated to save young lives and to support families both after a young sudden death and when a cardiac condition has been identified. There are many ways that we provide this support at CRY, but one of the most important ways is through our research program. Research provides the evidence that we need to identify who is at risk, how to reduce those risks, and how to best support people living with these conditions. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Papadakis. Michael joined CRY in 2007 as a research fellow. He's played a key role in many of the most important studies we have conducted over the past 10 years, both as someone doing the research, but also now supporting CRY research fellows as their supervisor. He is one of the CRI consultant cardiologists at the CRI Center for Inherited Cardiac Conditions at St. George's, and he also has had a number of prominent international positions and is the president-elect of the European Association of Preventative Cardiology. One of the great achievements in recent years has also been establishing a master's course in sports cardi cardiology at the University of London, helping to educate and promote the importance of cardiac conditions in young people both within the UK and internationally. I'm now going to pass you over to Michael to talk about how CRI's research has impacted the investigation and management of individuals at risk of sudden cardiac death. Do please send in your questions via the chat. We'll try to answer as many of these as possible at the end of the present presentation before we conclude at six o'clock. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here or in another webinar relating to the CRI research. You already had a, a very nice webinar by Professor Sharma a couple of weeks ago that I will invite you to go and have a listen if you haven't done that already. And I hope that what I'm going to say today it will supplement uh, very nicely what has already been discussed uh, with uh, Professor Sharma. And I've done my best to avoid any significant overlap. So the question is how CRI's research has impacted the investigation and management of individuals at risk of sudden cardiac death. And what I will try and present to you is research that we've done over the past year that had significant impact. A couple of things that I was very passionate about as I started them as a research fellow and also discuss the progression from one project that brings the next when you open a door, there are another two or three doors there to be investigated. And that's how we move on with research. So CRI has created an amazing resource and that amazing resource provides the, uh, the basic substance in order to promote uh, the research and answer the questions that need to be answered for our families. So they are assisting us with a big NHS clinic that we run at St. George's Hospital where we see more than 4,000 individuals annually with inherited cardiac conditions. We do have a large screening program that screens annually more than 30,000 individuals back in 2019. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do many screenings in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but that has also motivated us to look into our screening and improve it even further. And we have also the big cardiac pathology center that cardiac risk in the young supports with Professor Mary Seppert that accepts about 200 uh, hearts annually. So the combination of those three a database provides us amazing material in order to try and do research and improve prevention of sudden cardiac death. Now, in terms of prevention of sudden cardiac death, those are the four basic areas that we've been focusing over the past decade or so. Defining the burden of disease, what's the prevalence of different conditions, what's the incident of young sudden cardiac death. And although you may think that we have answered that question, there are still uh, answers that need to be brought forward. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Identify individuals at risk with our screening, with our ECG criteria. How do we go about investigating and re-stratifying those individuals who have identified? And very, very important, how do we manage those individuals in terms of both of medical management, but very, very importantly, particularly for young individuals, lifestyle and exercise. 
So let me start with the burden of sudden cardiac death in the young. It's not really that long ago, and that's 1995 when CRY was first created by Alison Cox, that we were quoting about one sudden cardiac death per week in young people. So it wasn't considered a major issue. Then gradually we started understanding that actually those sudden cardiac deaths were far more frequent than what we were told in the beginning. And eventually, in 2008, we published a study looking at the data of the Office of National Statistics, who gave us that estimate of 12 young cardiac deaths per week. Now, the way we went about that study, we looked at the data of the Office of National Statistics that are widely available between years 2002 to 2004 for individuals between the ages of 1 and 34 years. Now, here I've given you some examples of the codes that deaths go under. So, for example, cardiac arrhythmia, dilated cardiomyopathy. And we try to look at those codes in detail and classify them to different classes that you see here that will represent cardiac deaths with a normal autopsy or normal post-mortem, what we will call sudden arrhythmic death syndrome or SADS, and I'm sure you'll have heard this term already, then classify them to uh, sudden cardiac deaths who had a structural heart disease like the cardiomyopathies, sudden cardiac deaths that were a bit more non-specific in terms of not giving an exact cause of, cardi of the cardiac death that caused the death, and then, for the first time, we also included class B, where were classified as possible cardiac deaths. Because it's well established that sudden cardiac death and ion channelopathies or even cardiomyopathies can manifest as an epileptic fit, as an asthmatic attack, an unexplained drowning, uh, or, or, uh, or even a road traffic accident. So we try to include as many deaths in class B, and I'll explain how we use them. And the result of that study, which was published some time ago, was that in terms of definite cardiac deaths, our class is A1, A2, A3, who had an incident of 1.8 per 100,000 per year, which translated to about eight young cardiac deaths per week. In terms of the possible cardiac deaths, we had a similar prevalence. So the way we came up with the 12 young sudden cardiac deaths a week was adding eight and then taking about 20% as a modest proportion of those deaths that may be attributable to cardiac and going to 10. And then we accounted, obviously, for Scotland and Northern Ireland in order to get to number 12 for the United Kingdom. And I think that was a powerful uh, message in terms of the impact of sudden cardiac death in uh, the young individuals. Now, regarding the causes of cardiac death, you can see that we've got SATs that account for about 13%. Then we've got the heart muscle conditions, the cardiomyopathies, that accounted for about 25%. Myocarditis, 11%. Inflammation of the heart because of a viral infection, which is particularly relevant as well during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then look, we had a significant proportion of about 30, 35%, almost a third of the cohort that we accounted to coronary artery disease, essentially. And that may seem a bit strange to you as coronary artery disease is expected in older individuals. And I will explain why that may be the cause. Now, what we've done on this occasion, we did a second study and we said, okay, let's go back 10 years onwards, look at exactly the same data from the Office of National Statistics with exactly the same categories as we've done before and see whether there has been any change in the incidence of sudden cardiac death. And the results we find is that the instance has reduced a bit from 1.78 or 1.8 per 100,000 to about 1.6 per 100,000. This is statistically significant. It is a small difference, but there is a difference there. The same goes for the possible cardiac death from 1.8 to 1.6 per 100,000 per year. Now, obviously, we need to look at those results with caution but they may potentially be explained by the fact that we generally do more screening. And as I said, now we screen more than 35,000 indiv individuals per year. 
We also have improved the referral pathways for, fa for families with an inherited cardiac condition. And there is now that chapter eight of the National Health Service that recommends referral to a specialist center when a sudden cardiac death occurs or when inherited cardiac condition is suspected. We definitely have better management of conditions in the young, and we also have improved emergency care, including automated external defibrillators. However, the main point I wanted to make regarding the impact of uh, uh, the CRI research is relating to the causes. So this is the pie chart that you've seen already from 2000 to 2005, and this is the pie chart from 2011-2014. And what you can clearly see that the incidence of SATs has dramatically uh, increased from 13.5 to 28%. The incidence of cardiomyopathies has significantly reduced, as has the incidence of what we will assume or presume to be coronary artery disease, okay? So that may mean two things. One thing is that the causes of the sudden cardiac death in the young have changed, which I have to say I doubt, or there has been an influence on some sort of how we classify deaths. And I think that becomes quite clear when you look at the referrals in the CRI cardiac pathology laboratory that is run by Professor Shepard. And before really 2007 and before CRI went on and supported that effort. There were a small number of referrals, but since then the referrals have gradually increased. I put that up to 2014, but the trend is upward for the rest of the years. The other thing that you can see is that SADS, sudden arrhythmic death syndrome, forms a significant proportion and an increasing proportion of the diagnosis that Professor Shepard makes when she has a heart from a sudden cardiac death. Now, the other thing I wanted to highlight to you is that if you look at the absolute numbers that our second study demonstrated, and if I cross here a line around the 100 mark in the diagnosis that Professor Shepard makes, you can clearly see that we're potentially underestimating the impact of SAD from the ONS data. As Professor Shepard, for example, in 2012, identified almost 120 sad deaths, but only 19 were reported from the Office of National Statistics. And that demonstrates that there is a lot of work still to be done in terms of educating pathologists regarding the underlying causes of sudden death and ensuring that every victim gets a detailed and accurate pathology that will identify the exact cause of death. And you may wonder, well, is that important? And the reality is that's extremely important. Now, we are not surprised about the differences uh, that uh, Professor Shepard's research has done because we've known from 2013, from this study that was published, that actually it's particularly important to get it right because most of the time or a lot of the time we get it wrong. So what happened here, we looked at 158 consecutive cases of sudden cardiac death where the general pathologist in the light blue and Professor Shepard in the dark green looked at the same heart and classified the cause of death. And here you can see that there are quite significant differences in terms of the general pathologist diagnosing structural heart disease. But what happened when Mary looked at the heart well, what happened is that it was reclassified as a normal post-mortem, okay? And some of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cases were classified as simple hypertrophy or otherwise non-idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy. And you will hear that term on a number of occasions further in my presentation. And look at the difference. In 40% 40, 40 of the cases, there was a disagreement of opinion, which highlights further the importance of a specialist cardiac pathologist and why we may be getting it wrong in terms of classifying a death as coronary artery disease rather than a potentially inherited cardiac condition. So what we did, uh, we went on to look at a post-mortem evaluation 
And as I said, it's very, very important that we do that and we get the cause exactly because what will happen, it will guide familial evaluation. So when a family comes to me as a cardiologist, I always look at the postmortem. I always read the detail of the postmortem because that will detect, dictate, sorry, how I'm going to proceed with the clinical investigation. So if the pathology says to me myocarditis, then that may be considered an unfortunate incident, okay? So you've got a young person who had a viral infection that went to his heart and caused a sudden cardiac death. That's usually not inherited. If they say hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then a very focused evaluation with a simple tracing of the heart and an ultrasound scan may suffice. But if they say such, like Mary Shepard did in many cases, changing the diagnosis from cardiomyopathy to sudden arrhythmic death syndrome, then we will do further very comprehensive evaluation. And Professor Sharma has already referred to this study, so I won't go into it into detail, but this is our experience with more than 300 families who have experienced uh, SADS in the family and evaluating more than 900 relatives, okay? And this is the very detailed evaluation that we will do for the SADS family. So all I wanted to highlight to you is, again, the importance of the postmortem. So if they say hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that part of the evaluation with a history, examination, a simple tracing of the heart or the ultrasound scan suffices. But if that becomes such, then we have to proceed to further detailed evaluation to ensure we're not missing an underlying inherited cardiac condition and in particular a nine channelopathy. So all those questions uh, that we're finding uh, prompted further research, and this is a project I'm particularly proud of because we've started it with Professor Sharma when I was actually one of his fellows. So we were looking at all those families that were coming in our CRI inherited cardiac conditions clinic, and some of the postmortems did not make sense to us. So what we did is I went and looked at all the postmortems and I identified those who had a definite pathology that I was happy to satisfy diagnostic criteria. I looked at all of those who had normal SADS tests and then I identified those I was unhappy with, those that reported certain findings but of uncertain significance. And we looked at those families, 41 families, and looked at what do we actually find if we go and investigate them comprehensively. So we looked at 160 relatives who underwent comprehensive evaluation and negative were about 20 families and we identified an inherited cardiac condition in 21 families, okay? Out of them, a minority was cardiomyopathy and most were in electrical fault of the heart and nine channelopathy. And that was distributed between terms that you may have heard, such as Brugada syndrome, Long QT syndrome, and CPVT. So you can see how getting the postmortem right can affect the management of the family, how you can get it very right and very wrong as well. Now, this is a graphic representation of that study. Here you can see the findings that the pathologist reported. I won't bore you with that, but what I wanted to highlight is three examples. Look at this one, minor coronary artery disease. I'm highlighting that because if someone dies because of a myocardial infarction, then the likelihood is that the family will receive very little in terms of screening. But in two out of the six families were identified Brugada syndrome. The second example is myocarditis for the exactly the same reason. If it's identified, no further screening is required, but we identified one Brugada syndrome out of the two families. And lastly, the bigger category we had, those who had a heavy heart or scar in their heart, where can be attributed to cardiomyopathy, heart muscle condition, but actually we identified an ion channelopathy in a significant proportion of them. The last thing I wanted to highlight about this study is the impact that the CRI research has internationally as well, okay? Because look at this figure here, 
and look at the figure that was produced in Australia where they did exactly the same study in 59 families, okay? They identified exactly the same results, they had the same conclusions, and they're now following exactly the same principles of investigating families after a sudden cardiac death. Moving on, but in the same sort of theme, and that's what I meant when I was trying to say that we open a door and find some answers, and then we've got another three or four doors and another three or four questions now that we have to answer. So what happened next is went and looked at those heavy hearts, the last bar I demonstrated to you earlier. And we asked the question, is everyone who has a heavy heart at post-mortem, what we will call hypertrophy, a form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or not? And that's particularly relevant because I've told you already that if it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we've got limited screening. If not, we need to do more extensive evaluation. And the results of the study by Gerardo Finocchiaro is that actually in a third of cases, we will identify an inherited cardiac condition, but zero hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, okay? So again, ion channelopathies, accessory pathway, and one dilated and one arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So what does that tell us? It tells us that a heavy heart does not represent classic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So again, we need to be very careful when we interpret the postmortem. And those sort of individual families require in-depth evaluation, almost like a such family. And that's a very important message. And that's the practice we have adopted now in our clinic. Now, moving uh, from the familial evaluation, and this is the last study I'm going to present to you, uh, but staying in the concept of the hypertrophy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I have to say I'm particularly proud of this study because this is actually the first clinical trial that we perform with cardiac risk in the young. While up till now, most of our studies have been observational and analyzing the data that we've got available. It's important to know that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is one of the most common inherited cardiac conditions. So its prevalence is estimated between 1 in 500 to 1 in 1,000. So there are about potentially 120,000 people in the United Kingdom and more than 20 million people worldwide. Now, what happens with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Here I've got for you a normal heart. You can see the heart muscle, similar wall thickness. And look what happens here. The part of the heart muscle is very thick, so it obstructs the outflow, the, uh, the blood leaving the heart. And that can cause many symptoms in terms of chest pain, shortness of breath, dizzy spells, and even fainting episodes. And in the worst case scenario, significant irregularity of the heart rhythm and sudden cardiac arrest. Now, the estimated annual mortality is about one in 200 uh, across all age groups. And the thing is that with our screening program and similar screening programs around the world, we're identifying more young individuals who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because the ECG is an excellent screening tool for hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. And we need to ensure that we treat these individuals and we manage those individuals appropriately. Now, what do I mean by that? It's the advice regarding exercise, which is a very important aspect, okay? Now, we know that exercise is extremely beneficial for our health, and it's in obviously in healthy individuals, and you can look at this figure and see all the implications of exercise in, all, in terms of reducing cardiovascular events, reducing even dementia, reducing depression, fractures. So it has benefits in all aspects of our life. But we also know that exercise is very beneficial for most people who have an underlying heart disease. It's very well established that uh, exercise is very beneficial for coronary artery disease and individuals with heart failure. And it's also very beneficial in a dose-response relationship. What that means is that the more exercise you do, the more benefit you get up to a certain point, and you actually need very little in terms of exercise in order to start getting benefits. 
However, the problem that we've got with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and now put that in the context of identifying more and more younger individuals, is that we had evidence from the United States which demonstrate that actually hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is one of the major causes of sudden cardiac death in athletic individuals. And that obviously led to a lot of concern and disqualification of young people from many competitive sports, but most importantly, it caused reluctance of the doctors to prescribe any form of physical activity in those young people. And if you think about it, if you identify a young individual at the age of 20, the last thing you want is to get him sedentary as that potential individual has more 60, 70 or 80 years of life to live. And it's important that they don't develop other conditions such as coronary artery disease later in life. So with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we had a bit of what I will call the perfect storm in terms of we getting better in identifying the condition in younger population. We've improved our treatment so they will live longer. But on the other hand, we restrict them from exercise and we take away in a way all those benefits of exercise in the different aspects of our life. It was also very apparent from our young individuals in the my heart group that cry is running and I had the privilege of being the consultant cardiologist that the uh, young individuals with underlying hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other inherited conditions were feeling that there was a lack of exercise programs catering for their needs definitely within the national health system, but very importantly, the lack of expertise in doctors in order to provide them with that necessary exercise advice. And obviously the danger then is that either they don't do enough or they go to the other extreme and they do things that may not necessarily be safe for their condition. Importantly, this is a study that we published from Professor Shepard's data in athletic individuals regarding the causes of sudden cardiac death. And our study contradicted to some extent the study from the United States because it said that yes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does play a role, but there are others even more important causes such as the normal post-mortem. And remember I told you about that idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy as well as arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy that play a more important role in sudden cardiac death during exercise. Now, also initially, uh, people were very skeptical about our study because they were thinking, well, this is a very highly selected sample and can definitely have a referral bias. The reality is that subsequent studies in athletic individuals in the US, in young individuals in Australia, as well as young individuals in Greece demonstrated similar to our study that actually SATS is one of the most important causes of sudden cardiac death in young individuals and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy plays an important but potentially not as important relating to exercise as we thought before. And that's, I think, an important message because we soon discourage young individuals with exercise. And if I had a message for you today is that there is no individual who should not be engaging in some sort of physical activity. It's about having the knowledge and the expertise to prescribe the right sort of physical activity. So with our trial, we try to test if it's feasible to have a fairly high intensity exercise program that can uh, cater for the needs of younger individuals, whether that program is safe and whether it improves the fitness, the cardiovascular risk profile in terms of high blood pressure and high cholesterol, as well as the quality of life of those young individuals. Now, the only reason I'm showing you this slide is to highlight that we try to get for a younger age group in order to answer the question for younger individuals. And also look that we started from a number of 640 and we ended up with 80 individuals in the age. And you can see what the challenge is with creating those sort of trials. So we had two groups, the control group that had 40 individuals who received the usual NHS care and 40 individuals that participated in our comprehensive exercise program. Now, 
I, I won't bore you with the details of uh, the exercise program, but what I wish to highlight and praise Joy Basu as well as the rest of the team is that they did an amazing work and they created amazing material in order to be able to personalize the exercise program on those young individuals. And you can even go and look at those YouTube videos that they created to ensure that even if they couldn't make it to the hospital, that they were able to do the exercise at home. So we did a 12-week exercise program with a comprehensive assessment at the beginning and at the end. And also, and very importantly, we provided them with 30-minute educational session regarding diet as well as lifestyle and very intensive monitoring in order to ensure that we get the right the dose of exercise as well as we detect any arrhythmias early to ensure that everyone was kept safe. And these are the results in terms of feasibility. Yes, the program was feasible. Uh, we had compliance of 83%, which if you compare it with the usual compliance of cardiac rehab programs, which does not exceed 50 to 60%, was excellent, okay? The acceptability of the program was very good, and the people were very satisfied with the information and the exercises that they were offered. In terms of safety, there were no major arrhythmias, and the arrhythmias that we detected were equal in the exercise as well as the control group. And most importantly, if you look at the impact of exercise of the exercise group compared to the control group, they became fitter. And this is the VO2 max that we study, how efficient is your heart and your muscles in extracting oxygen. Their blood pressure went down by seven millimeters of mercury. They reduce their cholesterol, they reduce the body weight, and they reduce the depression and anxiety scores. So overall, a very positive message from this trial that high-intensity exercise is possible in younger individuals in the right hand, so you don't increase the risk of arrhythmias. And remember that an improvement in the fitness does eventually lead to reduction in mortality later in life. And we hope that this program will, at the very least, form the basis for individualized exercise prescription and even the creation of cardiac rehabilitation program for those individuals with inherited cardiac conditions within the national health system, which now are left in their own accord. And I would like to thank the whole team here, as well as the Alex Reed Memorial Fund, who sponsored part of the trial and make this study for us possible. Now, before I finish, I would like to give you a taste of what's coming in 2021. Now, we're doing a major uh, study and uh, service evaluation in order to try and improve our screening program. So we're working very hard in order to ensure that we further optimize screening tools, further refine the ECG interpretation, search for novel ECG markers of disease and evaluate the impact of our program in individuals. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to present you with data in 100,000 screened individuals in the next six months or so. We work with, continue working with identifying the condition and make sure we get it right. And the athletic population is a perfect uh, population that helps us look at the individuals in extreme and help us differentiate between physiology and pathology. We try to further optimize our investigative protocols in terms of further investigations of individuals who are highlighted by screening as having an abnormal ECG. With the impact of COVID-19 in the heart, we also look more into the issue of myocarditis and how we can provide better treatment and prevent sudden cardiac death. And finally, we further refining exercise prescription in healthy cardiac conditions based on the results of our initial trial. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be delighted to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, Yes, yeah, so please do, if you have any questions, please do forward them through on the chat. Um, they're not public questions. They'll just come straight to me and the team behind the scenes. Um, what, one of the, the areas which you mentioned there was the optimization of the investigation of families. Um, 
can you tell us a bit more about some of the areas you're going to be looking into in that work? So, uh, thank you very much, Steve. So, uh, what our research has produced already is the optimal protocol, which is the complete protocol for the such families that I indicated, in terms of how they should be investigated to ensure we don't miss a condition. For example, what our studies have identified is that adjumaline provocation test, which is a special drug that we give, it's a particular sensitive method and a very safe method, the way we perform it, in order to identify individuals with an electrical fault of the heart called the Brugada syndrome, which you won't be able to identify differently. And that's because the ECG can vary between normal and abnormal in individuals who have the condition. And obviously that's particularly relevant in respect to a family coming from all different corners of the United Kingdom in order to be investigated in an expert center during a single session, because you may catch or may not catch the abnormal ECG. The other thing that we're looking at is at the impact of uh, cardiac MRI, for example, in that cardiac MRI is something we utilize on a, a regular basis, but we need to remember that it's not available in all different centers and in all different countries as well. So we try to ensure that we use cardiac MRI when it's really necessary, and we try to look at how, when and how and what sort of protocols we use in order to optimize the value of a relatively expensive and difficult investigation in the context of a family with sudden cardiac death or sudden arrhythmic death syndrome. For example, you saw that for the families that we've got a scar or that idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy, the cardiac MRI was particularly helpful in excluding an underlying cardiomyopathy before we were able to make a diagnosis of a nine channelopathy. We also know that potentially cardiac MRI may be more useful in slightly older individuals rather than adolescents who are unlikely to have developed the full a blown picture of the condition. So those are the things we're looking at. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, just, um, you know, going back to what you've just said there, looking forward, but if we look back as well at um, then the, you know, the cardiac MRI and the Ashmaline test, there are many families who we're supporting who will have supported for you know, potentially more than 20 years now. And things have changed a lot in that time. So what, what's your advice to them if, for instance, they were, you know, screened many years ago and they didn't have the MRI or they didn't have the Ashmaline test or weren't assessed in that way? Would there be, um, if everything was cleared 10 years ago, um the, the the family and the siblings were reassured w would you be encouraging them maybe to come back into referral procedure uh, I, I think steve this is a difficult question because we also need to be pragmatic and obviously the last thing i will want is to uh, worry families that they had a death many years ago they've been investigated they've been reassured so I think the first thing to say, which is the thing that I always say to the families that we see here, whether they've been identified or even not identified with the condition, is that if you develop any symptoms that cause concern, whether that's chest pain, new shortness of breath, palpitations, dizzy spells, and definitely fainting episodes, then in the context of the family history, please do not ignore it you need to have a bit of higher level of uh, alert, if you want, to sensitivity compared to someone who has no family history of sudden death. And as I said, that's exactly the advice I see to the families that we see in our clinic. We perform a very comprehensive evaluation and we're unable to identify anything because we do need to reassure the families, but we also, it's important that we recognize our limitations. Now, if a family is particularly concerned, and indeed if the screening was 10 or 15 years ago, uh, there is a high probability that some of the investigations that we do these days, whether that's the 
high leads of the special ECGs we do in the test for Brugada syndrome, or potentially a cardiac MRI may have been judged to be necessary today, which was not 10 or 15 years ago. So if they're particularly worried, then they can go and discuss it with their GP, or if the, you know, the GP is in an impossible position of offering an opinion, that would be perfectly understandable. They can either contact us or get their GP to contact us and we can try and provide them with uh, advice. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, one of the questions which is obviously is um, relevant right now, especially, is the um, the, the overlap, you know, potential with COVID and sudden cardiac death. I, I know we've talked about that a bit, about some research around that area. And of course, Mary Shepherd is in a position where, um, you know, she'll be more aware of what, what can happen. So is there anything you can tell us about that? I know we've done some webinars on that earlier on in the year, but is there, been, is there anything you could share with us about that? So what I can tell you about COVID-19 is, first of all, that as we all know, it's a novel virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that's causing COVID-19 infection. So we're still learning about it. However, what I would like to reassure uh, our listeners is that our experience here at St. George's, and we've seen many, many, many cases, is that actually COVID-19 will affect your heart in terms of creating an inflammation, what we'll call myocarditis, in only a minority of cases. And that's also the experience with the screening that we've done up till now in elite athletic individuals who had the COVID-19 infection and they recovered from it. As such, even the protocol that we produced for screening young individuals after a COVID-19 infection that they want to go back to exercise is fairly conservative and very pragmatic. And I will invite again people who when, did not attend that particular webinar to have a listen at the CRI webinar that we performed earlier this year relating particularly to this subject. However, on the other hand, as I said, we're still learning about it. And we have discussed on a number of occasions, Steve, because I believe that our screening program uh, provides a unique opportunity to look at the impact of COVID-19. Because obviously the benefit that we will have as CRI is that we have a number of individuals that have been screened already. So we know what the ECG looks like and we could potentially try and get a new ECG and a transthoracic echocardiogram, an ultrasound scan after they have recovered from the COVID-19 infection. And if we're able to do that in big numbers, then probably we'll be able to provide some very useful uh, results for uh, uh, to inform us about the impact of COVID-19 in the heart. Hope we didn't lose Steve. I think because we've have lost Steve a bit, I'll go on and read some of your questions. Uh, so, uh, we've discussed about COVID-19 and sudden cardiac death. The other important thing to say, uh, 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 the other important thing to say about that, however, is that obviously we need to um, uh, be aware of individuals who already have an underlying uh, cardiac condition, an underlying inherited cardiac condition. So, individuals who have already been diagnosed with cardiomyopathy or an ion channelopathy, they will potentially need to take a bit more precaution and be a bit more cautious about the infection. And obviously, if their symptoms deteriorate, they will should be asking for uh, advice and assistance by the relevant physicians. And then I've got another question with the 41 male cases with uncertain autopsy results that were then assessed for familial causes. There were 20 with no familial cause. What was the conclusion for those cases? Does the cause remain unknown? Any speculation on what the cause 
could be? That's an excellent question. And that's actually our experience even with our bigger cohort. So even the big study of the 300 families were actually able to identify an underlying cardiac condition in about 40 to 45% of the families. So the other 50 to 55% will leave our clinic after having been comprehensively evaluated with no inherited cardiac condition having been identified. Now, there are a number of explanations for that. Uh, the, the first potential explanation is that as you realize, if you have an inherited cardiac condition, ideally, if someone dies, the, the, uh, the ideal scenario is that you screen mom and dad from where they got the, gen, uh, the DNA. In some of those families, we are unable to screen mom and dad, so potentially we may be screening mom and another sibling, and if that was the carrier, then you won't be able to identify that condition. The second possibility is that all inherited cardiac conditions need to start from someone, and that's what we will call the novo variants, in that the deceased had a genetic defect that caused the inherited cardiac condition, but neither mom, dad, or any other family member will express that disease. So if they were to have children in the future, for example, then they may have been able to pass the condition, but no one from the parents or siblings will express that condition. The other thing that we have to also understand is that a, a, a cardiac post-mortem is quite challenging. For example, one of the most common conditions that we identified during our screening is what we call WPW, or an accessory pathway, an extra pathway that connects the top with the bottom chambers of the heart. Now, this is impossible for a cardiac pathologist to identify simply because they will have to spend hours upon hours upon hours dissecting in extreme detail the heart, and that's practically not possible. And finally, we of course have to admit that this is a very challenging field, and because it's a challenging field, there are things that we don't quite understand yet. And that's what I meant when I say that it's important to get the balance right of reassuring the family that we have investigated them as comprehensively as possible, while on the other hand, explaining that if something new comes up instead of symptoms, they should not ignore it and still come back to us for further investigations. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm not sure. We're having all sorts of IT problems behind the scenes. I was Don't just... worry, I think we did well. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, um, brilliant. Um, I think um, one of the questions, I'm not sure if I missed it, but um, was around genetic testing when the families are, are referred into the clinic. Do you have any thoughts on um, you, you know, the importance of genetic testing when you're looking after families? Yeah, I mean, genetic testing, obviously, we've got genetic conditions, so it's particularly important in the evaluation of the family. However, I would like to highlight that at this point in time, with the knowledge and technology that we've got regarding genetic testing, clinical evaluation remains paramount. And it's the clinical evaluation that will give us the majority of diagnosis in the families that we see in our clinic. However, that doesn't mean that we don't continue uh, uh, researching genetic testing and also we will use it in particular circumstances in clinical practice. For example, uh, it's particularly important both for clinical purposes as well for research purposes that we try and collect genetic material from the deceased. Uh, and that material can be used if later on the pathologist makes a diagnosis of a heart muscle condition, such as arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. We know that the genetic yield in cardiomyopathy, such as arrhythmogenic or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, can be up to 50, 60, and sometimes 70%. So that's a very good use of genetic testing because if you identify the condition of the uh, deceased heart, and you test his DNA, you identify the variant that's causing the condition, then you can do genetic testing in mom and dad and potentially even avoid the clinical screening, assuming that genetic testing can happen in a timely fashion, which is not always the case. 
The other way we use genetic testing is in clinical practice in terms of if we identify clinically someone with long QT syndrome or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from the family members, then we will go and test that individual's DNA who has the diagnosis. And if we identify a positive variant, then we'll be able to spread genetic testing into the rest of the family. Regarding genetic testing in SADS, at least at post-mortem, what we'll call molecular autopsy, I will say that it's still on a research basis with a very low yield. And that's why we are doing quite significant research in that field to see how we can improve that potential yield and even potentially identify conditions that we don't quite understand at this point in time. Thank you, Michael. That's really interesting. Um, one of the questions which comes up a lot with families as well is around pregnancy. So when, you know, when we have a young mother who's pregnant, how, how would you manage that situation with a family who come into your clinic where there's a pregnancy? Well, the, 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 the concern uh, uh, regarding uh, having offspring can start even from before conception. And obviously individuals who have a genetic condition, they may come to our clinic and let us know of their plan to have children and ask the question can be done uh, and we can refer them to specialist genetics clinics where they can meet counselors and geneticists and get the right advice as to how that process can work for that individual family if we've got someone who falls uh, pregnant with a genetic condition then depending on the condition we will most definitely be able to manage things most individuals who have a genetic condition, and in particular cardiomyopathy, they will have already received advice if there are concerns regarding a potential pregnancy in terms if they've got a very weak heart, for example, that we worry it may not cope. But if that's not the case, then we will manage those individuals. Our advice for most uh, 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 pregnant ladies is that they are managed in a center that there is the obstetrician as well as the specialist cardiologist who can manage the condition throughout the pregnancy, during the delivery and the immediate period after the delivery. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think what, one of the other challenges, um, and I'm not sure if you touched upon this, was when, when we don't find anything, when the autopsy is normal, and all the investigations are normal, either if there's been a tragedy or if there's been a cardiac arrest and someone is normal and they've had all these investigations. We've done that one. OK, thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> Cheers. Well, I think um, what would you say, just looking back, the most important piece of cry research that you've been part of and um, why would that be? So uh, I, I think in my mind, two things uh, stick in my mind, which have had significant impact. Uh, the first one is all the, uh, all the studies we've done with the interpretation of the 12 lead ECG, because my view is, and that's evident by the fact that they have been incorporated in the ECG criteria that fall the gold standard now for the interpretation of the 12 lead ECG worldwide, not only in the United Kingdom. And I think the research that we've done through the CRI research program is paramount. Uh, it has made the ECG screening program possible by reducing significantly what we will call the false positive rate of the ECG. So people that are flagged up as having an abnormal ECG while they don't really have an underlying cardiac condition. And we've seen dramatic changes. We've seen false positives going down from 15% to 2 or 3% individuals of white descent and respectively individuals of black descent from 25, 30%, which is not really manageable for a screening program to five, six, seven percent So that has been an extremely important piece of research that makes screening possible. The other thing that is very close to my heart is uh, some of the studies that I presented today particularly looking at the exact cause of sudden cardiac death and ensuring that we get it right. Because unfortunately, there have been quite a few families that have been falsely reassured after 
a post-mortem, that is that there is nothing in terms of an inherited cardiac condition. And I'm sure, Steve, that you've seen a few cases during your time where you had a, a death in the family and then five, ten years down the line, a second death which could have been prevented. Thank you very much, Michael. I think um, on that note, you, you know, we're, I'm really sorry for the, some of the glitches which occurred. Um, Throughout this, it's very unpredictable. Um, I think I've been kicked off the internet for the first time in the last nine months. This happened to coincide tonight. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for, for joining us tonight, to, for answering questions. If you have any further questions, please do forward them through to us. Um, we'll be holding um, you know, many more webinars um, going forward with um, doctors who are working with CRY, with Sanjay, Michael, Mary Shepherd, talking more about specific projects. Um, I saw one or two questions there, which uh, I wasn't sure if we actually answered, looking at some of the longitudinal research we're doing um, going forward. Um, and we'll be looking to profile those over the next 12 months. So um, on that note, I'd really just like to say thank you very much to Michael um, for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for all of, all of you who have attended and just wishing you the best over the next uh, few weeks into the new year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.